Good morning, Congregation of Golden Isles Presbyterian Church. It is good to be with you uh, again on this Lord's Day morning as we gather uh, virtually uh, to join our hearts and our minds, uh, if not our voices, uh, on uh, the goodness, the greatness of our God and the wonder of the redemption that he has brought for us in Christ Jesus. If you're visiting with us this morning, if this is uh, maybe your first time clicking on our uh, virtual service, or if you've been joining us over these past few weeks but are not a regular in our congregation, we are glad that you're joining us and we pray that your time uh, with us as we uh, join together over the internet on these Lord's Days will be times of great blessing to you uh, as well as to us. Uh, let us begin this morning by being called to worship by the words of Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, you are great and greatly to be praised. A God who is great in glory, a God who sits enthroned amongst the cherubim, the God who burns with glory, the God who sat on Sinai as, as a burning inferno who led his ancient people in that pillar of cloud and fire. You are a God who is resplendent in his majesty, a God of justice and righteousness and goodness and truth. You are the God of whom it is said, you are light and in you there is no darkness at all. But yet you are a God also who is great in his mercy. A God who is great in his grace. A God who is great in his tenderness towards mankind. Oh, Father, as we come in worship this morning, we come as those who have seen both aspects of our God and who rejoice in both aspects of our God. We thank you that you are in control that you rule all things according to the counsel of your own will. So this world is not nearly as out of control as we are tempted to believe. But we thank you that you are also one who is gentle with us. One who is tender hearted towards us. Who bears us up. Who binds up the broken hearted. O oh Lord, we pray that you would come now and minister to us this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come and lead us in our time of worship. That he would open the scriptures to us, that we would behold magnificent things within them. That he would give us attention and focus as we pray together. That he would help us to confess with our mouths sincerely the faith that we believe. Lord, come now, we pray, and build up your saints in our most holy faith and all to the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, scattered congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now join together in our prayer of confession of sin. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we come at once rejoicing in the goodness of our God and lamenting the sin that remains within our own lives. We come, Father, delighting ourselves in you, the one who is the giver of good things and the one who has only ever given us good things. You are the God who brings the rain to fall upon the righteous and the wicked. You are the God who is gracious to the righteous and the wicked, patient, not as uh, no, slow to fulfill your promise of Christ's return, not as some count slowness, but patient towards us, not desirous that any would perish, but that they would come to a knowledge of the gospel. Lord, you are a God who gives good things continually. And as those who have come to know you as you are revealed supremely in Christ Jesus, you are the God who has shown us grace, who has washed away all of our sin so that we now stand before you as, as Christ in Christ, credited with the righteousness of Christ, that we might be called the sons and daughters of God. Oh Lord, we rejoice in that goodness of God, but yet we lament, Father, for we know the sin that remains within our lives. We know the, the ways in which we break your law in thought, word, and deed. We know how, like faithless sheep we are prone to wander from our good shepherd oh lord we pray this morning that you would forgive our many sins that according to all of your promises in christ jesus you would cast them as far from us as the east is from the west that you would bury them in the very depths of the sea we pray that you would cleanse up with us with hyssop that you would wash us as white as snow and we pray that you would give us the grace of your holy spirit that we might more and more grasp the goodness of our god not just in our heads but in our hearts so that when we are faced with the temptation to break your law we would flee from that temptation knowing that no good lies there as tempting as it might be, as seductive and persuasive it might be, it is a lie. For the law of God is the rule of our life. And there is no bad thing in the law that comes from the holy good God. And so we pray, Father, that your spirit would guide us and lead us. That we might live lives of righteousness. That we might live to your glory. That we might live in a way that reflects the security that we have in you through Christ. Father, we pray this in his name. Amen. Hear now the assurance of God's pardon for those who truly repent of their sins and hold to Jesus by faith for the forgiveness of those sins. Our assurance of pardon this morning comes from Hebrews 10. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering... He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Amen and Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 23. Genesis chapter 23. We have been over the last few 
weeks, the last few months, following along the story of Abraham that is absolutely uh, foundational uh, for our understanding of the gospel and the revelation of redemption as it progresses throughout the Old Testament and comes to its fulfillment in Christ. We have seen how that story is filled with its ups and its downs, these promises that God makes to humanity through Abraham. And we have seen Abraham's tremendous faithfulness, faithlessness uh, by way of contrast. We have seen God being faithful uh, to bring redemption for his people, faithful to, to fulfill his promises despite the faithlessness of his people. This morning we come to Genesis chapter 23 and the death of Abraham's wife, uh, Sarah. It is a a heartbreaking moment in the story, but with Abraham's purchase of of Sarah's grave in Canaan, uh, we see the very first fruits of God's promise to Abraham uh, that he would receive the land of Canaan as an inheritance. So even in the death of Sarah, we see the faithfulness of God in the fulfillment of his promises. So Genesis chapter 23. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to uh, to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephraim was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites of all who went in at the city, at the gate of his city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will, hear me. I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Amen. This is the holy, inerrant, and infallible word of the living God. May he add his own blessing to that reading from it. 
Let us now join together in our pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we continue on this morning in another week in which we are separated from enjoying the fellowship of Christ's church, we find our hearts echoing the cry of the psalmist and crying out to you, How long, O Lord? How long will you keep your people in exile? How long will you keep your church dispersed? How long will you keep us from receiving the means of grace as the corporate people of God? O Lord, we see in your word how the gathering together of the saints is an, is a, an essential component of the discipleship of our Lord Jesus. There is no such thing in Scripture as a private or individualized Christianity that exists outside of the corporate gathering. It is the gathering of the saints that is the essential part of the Christian life that builds us up in our faith, that challenges us in our remaining sins, that reminds us of the promises of the gospel, that, that buoys us up when we are downcast, that enables us to give full expression to our celebration when we are rejoicing. It is here in the corporate gathering that you meet in special ways with your people. We read in our New Testaments of the blessings of God that were poured out upon the corporate gatherings of the Lord's people. We see it in our Old Testaments as Israel were gathered to the temple and received the blessings of God as they remembered and celebrated together the works of God in redemption. And so, Lord, we come crying, how long? How long will you keep us from this place of special blessing? How long will you keep us apart? We pray, Father, that you would continue to give us the grace that we need to bear up under these unusual circumstances. Oh, Father, we pray that your Spirit would be at work to to strengthen us against the special temptations that come during this time. Lord, we know that this is a time of strain, a time of strained personal relationships, a time when within, the, within families, within couples, as we are forced to spend more time with each other than normal, it is, a, it is an occasion for conflict to be inflamed. It is an occasion for our, our pride to be provoked. Oh Lord, we find ourselves strained even as we are kept from one another. And we are deprived of the privilege of all that non-verbal communication that is so important when we gather together as Christ church, even as we gather together in our workplaces and with our friends, Lord, kept in the sphere of the voice, our minds can run and begin to wonder what we meant, what others meant. We can begin to wonder what others are thinking, why they're not calling. We can begin to attribute motive and it can fracture relationships. We know that there is strain financially on so many of your people. There is worry and concern over retirement plans with the crash of the stock market. Oh Lord, there is so much that comes to bear, but we pray for the help of your Spirit, that he would steal us against these things, that he would help us to be quick to see our sin to be quick to confess our sin and to run to you again for grace that we might obey your law in thought, word, and deed. O oh Lord, undoubtedly during this season you are using it to show us our sin, 
to show us some of our blind spots. And we pray then that this separation would be a means of grace to us. That we might see ourselves in a new light. And that we might come seeking your grace. Our Father, we pray this morning for those within our church who have particular stresses and strains just now. We do pray for those who are facing financial difficulties and pray that you would help them, that you would remind them of your promise to provide their daily bread. We pray for those who are struggling with illness or or injury and, and are finding themselves deprived of the regular medical care that they would otherwise enjoy. Lord, comfort them in their time of need. Bring healing to their bodies and bring peace to their minds. Our Father, we pray for those who are anxious about the future, who still have jobs but are uncertain how long that will remain. For our children who have had to end this school year with online learning and who do not know what the next academic year will hold. Father, help us all to heed the words of our Lord Jesus, that that every day has enough care of its own, that we have no cause to be anxious about tomorrow, but we can simply rest in you and in the knowledge of your constant care. Oh, Father, may you grant us in this congregation peace in Christ. May that be the mark of your people throughout this land, that we would be unusually serene in this time of uncertainty, that our eyes, our hearts would be fixed on you, and it would anchor us in this storm, so that we would be able to say with Paul that whether the future holds prosperity or poverty, whether it holds abundance or deprivation, Yet we will not be moved, for we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Our Father, we pray that you would give us opportunity to speak of Christ to those who do not yet know him. That you would give us wisdom that we might speak to families and friends and co-workers of how Christ is our anchor at this time and how he relieves us of our anxieties and our stresses. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to lead them to see the goodness of Jesus. And may it be that by your Spirit they would put their faith in him. Our Father, we continue to pray for our nation's leaders, for our state leaders, for our local leaders, as they try to balance the the various aspects of the care that has been entrusted to them as they try to to balance safety and health with with the economy and national security we pray that you would help them and guide them and give them a way forward we pray father for statesmen in our day men women who are willing to stand and do what's right though it may result in the ire of the populace we pray that you would give them wisdom and grit and determination that they would guide this country this state this community well father we also pray for our local community as we continue to to reel from the shooting of ahmed arbery oh lord we pray for all those who are involved in the trial of the mcmanuses and we pray that justice would be done that righteousness would prevail and we pray father that the death of this young man would not be in vain and it might even be a a, a, the, the cause of greater harmony between the historically divided black and white communities we pray that it would be something that would precipitate a more intentional reconciliation within our local community and within our state. Our Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you have given us in Christ. We thank you that this morning, though the world around us is in disarray, 
We know that you are on your throne and you do all that you please. Help us to trust you. Help us to rest in you. For we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would take your copies of God's Word in hand and turn with me uh, this morning to Isaiah chapter 8. We'll look together at the first eight verses of that chapter. Uh, Please do uh, find a Bible, uh, open the Bible app on your phone and and follow along. I know that that worshipping at home means you are worshipping in a in a situation of great distraction, uh, but hopefully if you have a Bible, preferably a paper Bible, it will help you uh, focus as we uh, go through this text uh, together. So Isaiah chapter 8 from verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, take a large tablet and write on it in common characters belonging to Mahar Shalal Hash Baz. And I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hash Baz. For before the boy knows how to cry, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke to me again, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin, the son of Ramalia. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks. And it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. And its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land. O Emmanuel, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come this morning praying for the help of your Holy Spirit. As we come now to study your Holy Word. Lord, this book that we are going through is one that is difficult to understand. It is full of imagery of a land far, far away in a time long, long ago. But we pray for the ministry of your Spirit now, that we might properly read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this portion of your Word, and all to your glory. Amen. Well, one of the extraordinary things about the book of Isaiah is the determination of God that we see here to bless his people in spite of themselves. If ever there was a part of your Bible that spoke to the patience and the long-suffering of God, if ever there was a part of your Bible that spoke to the veracity of 2 Peter 3, 9, that God is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards his people, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It is the prophets at the end of our Old Testaments. These books, as confusing as they can be, and as full of grim warnings of God's judgment of sin as they are, these books are books that are dripping with the patience and long-suffering of God towards his people. The the golden thread, we could say, that unites these books is the constant extension of God's grace and mercy to his disobedient people. The context into which all of the prophetic books are written is, is one of disobedience. It's one of rebellion against God. It's one in which the law of God has been trampled underfoot and replaced by a law of man's own making but yet into that darkness of sin and rebellion constantly shines this offer of God's grace for those who hear the gospel repent of their sins and lay hold of God's gracious promises ultimately brought to fulfillment in Jesus Christ 
It's the very thing, as we have said, that underpins all of the warnings of judgment that we see in these books, in Isaiah here. Right? Whenever you hear a prophetic warning of judgment, either in the New Testament or the Old Testament, it's never a cruel mocking of the wicked. Right? It's never a, a schoolyard gloating that the rebellious are going to, to get punishment, that they will receive what's getting, that, that's coming for them in the end. These declarations of, of God's punishment of sin, these warnings of God's coming judgment, they're not cruel mockings, they are not provocative statements, but rather they are a declaration of God's righteousness. It is the declaration on the one hand of the good news that all evil doing, all injustice, will indeed one day be punished, even if those perpetrators escape earthly justice. But it's also the good news that there is forgiveness for the repentant. Right? God is good to warn us of how his justice hits against our sin. God is good to us to tell us how he is our enemy in our sin. And the implication in all of these warnings of God's judgment is the same. It is if you hear the warning, heed the warning. Turn from your sin. Cast yourself upon the mercy of God. And his wrath against you in your sin will be turned into his favor for you in your faith. Now sometimes, of course... That invitation to repentance is not just an implicit implication of the warning, but, but if sometimes, occasionally, there will be an explicit invitation. We've seen that in Isaiah, haven't we? As God, through his prophet, has invited the wicked to return to him in humble submission, explicitly promising to them his abundant blessings if they turn from their sin. All the way through Isaiah, we see that mercy of God. We see that patience of God. We see that gracious slowness of God. Giving time for people to hear and heed his word and turn from their sin in faith and obedience. And it's something that we are seeing being brought out here, isn't it? As we look in particular in this section of Isaiah and Isaiah's interactions with King Ahaz. Chapters 7 through 12 of Isaiah form a subsection of this book that some have called the book of Emmanuel. Because of how often the prophet returns to that theme of God being with his people. However, this goodness of God the King stands, as we have seen, in vivid contrast to the human kings who instead of leading the people to rejoice in their God, are actively leading their people away from God and encouraging them to put their faith in virtually everything and anything else. King Ahaz is the king in these chapters, and if you go back and Read the short account of his reign in 2 Chronicles 28. You will see just how awful he was. The life of King Ahaz was one that was marked by, by profound devotion. But not to Israel's God. Ahaz was a man who was profoundly devoted to almost any other God that he could find. 2 Chronicles 28 tells us that Ahaz made metal images of the pagan gods and offered worship to them, even sacrificing one of his own sons to the pagan gods. It tells us that King Ahaz closed the doors of the temple, essentially barring the people of Israel from coming and worshipping God. He took the vessels of the temple and he he, he cut them up for scrap and he used them to, to buy favor from pagan, 
kings. He was a man who erected altars to the pagan gods in virtually every city of Judah. So here was the king. The man who, in a sense, was to be the lead worshipper of the people of God, who was leading the people of God away from God to put their hope and their confidence and their devotion in almost anything other than God. Ahaz was a man resolved to trust in himself and in his political acumen rather than in the promises of God. And Ahaz really stands as typical He stands essentially as a personification of the state of the kingdom that he ruled. We saw it in the first five chapters, didn't we? How the kingdom of Judah en masse has turned their backs on God. And they have put their trust in in sensual things. They have put their trust and their confidence in things that can be seen and heard and tasted and touched and smelled and and felt contrary to second corinthians 5 7 the people of judah have become a people who walk by sight and not by faith and ahaz stands really as supreme among them but yet as we saw last week god is here resolute to to bless his people. God is determined here to to bless his people despite of their wickedness. Now we would not have been surprised if God had just turned his back on them. We see it in the northern kingdom. We see God's removal of his blessing in that northern kingdom. If you look at the histories of the two kingdoms after they are divided after the death of solomon the southern kingdom of judah is blessed at least to have the occasional good and godly king but there's no such king in the northern kingdom of israel there god seems to have just withdrawn his hand of blessing from them because of their great wickedness and faithlessness We would not be surprised if he did the same thing to the southern kingdom of Judah. But instead, what we find is a resolute determination to bless them. Or, at the very least, a resolute determination to continually offer them blessing. And so despite Ahaz's self-reliance and his murder and his idolatry, despite his gross and egregious sin. God has been merciful to him and through him merciful to the kingdom. We have seen how God has lifted the curtain for Ahaz and in his grace he has shown him that the world is not as it appears to his senses. Israel and Syria, these two kingdoms that are threatening the stability of Judah, that are breathing down his neck and threatening to depose him, and overtake his kingdom these powers might look mighty and threatening but God has told Ahaz in his divine plan Israel and Syria will fall before the Assyrians and they will become as nothing before the Assyrians who will come at the bidding of God it's the same theme that continues here at the beginning of chapter 8 It's the same theme that really is is strengthened, intensified here. As Isaiah's wife now bears a son whose name is Mahar Shalal Hash Baz. Which, as the footnote in your Bible should tell you, means the spoil speeds, the prey hastens. And the promise is given to Ahaz that within the lifetime of this child really even within his infancy so we're talking just a matter of months from when Isaiah is speaking Ahaz is assured that the kingdoms that currently threaten him these kingdoms of Israel and Syria that are posturing against him threatening him seeming to hold in their hands the power of life and death over him in just a matter of months these kingdoms will be devastated by a rapid invasion of the Assyrians now this is of course 
the second incarnate promise sign that God has given to Ahaz. In chapter 7, you remember, there was the promise of the child called Emmanuel, God with us. And now here, Mahar Shalal Hash Baz. These two children were tangible signs. The growth of these children would be like the, the passing of an hourglass before Ahaz. If, if Ahaz wondered if these things would come to pass, he would only need to look upon the growth of these children to know when the hour was at hand. And these children and the prophetic word that accompanied them, there was the persistent offer of God's grace to him. Ahaz was shown God's grace in chapter 7 verse 12 when he refused to accept God's invitation to ask for a sign. Ahaz had revealed his, his heart that he was a man who would rebel against God. God had said, ask of me a sign. And Ahaz said that he would not ask a sign of God. It was, it was rebellion against the command of God, though it was cloaked in pious language. But yet God in his grace gave him the sign of Emmanuel. And now he gives him this second son. Both of them are, are the extension of God's patience and mercy to him. Here is Ahaz resolved that he is going to do things in his own way. He's going to, he's going to live his life the way that he thinks is best. He's going to get out of this, this tight corner by his political acumen and his diplomatic skill. And he is going to, to figure it out for himself. He doesn't want God coming in and helping him. He doesn't want anything. He wants to do it by himself. And yet God is patient to him. God is merciful to him. And Isaiah has watched the birth of these two boys. As he watched them grow, they would be perpetual witnesses to God's promise. Perpetual invitations to him to, to turn from his self-centered rebellion. To repent of his sin and then even like the king of Nineveh to lead his nation in repentance. But we also see... The kind condescension of God to this wicked king. Not only does he give him another tangible sign, but God here further reveals to him what the future holds. He lifts that curtain just a little bit further and reveals to Ahaz what is coming for Israel and Syria. As we noted last week, God could have left it at chapter 7 verse 9. Right, he had essentially told Ahaz everything that he needed to know. God had given him his unbreakable word that Israel and Syria would fall. But not only has God given the tangible signs of these two sons, Emmanuel and Mahar Shalal Hash Baz, to confirm his word of warning, he also outlines for Ahaz what specifically is going to happen when he summons the Assyrians down to sweep over these rebellious kingdoms. It's what we saw at the end of chapter 7, wasn't it? Those four sections that begin with the words, in that day. God gives to Ahaz this, this picture of, this vivid picture of, of absolute destruction. But God is in control of all that will befall Israel and Syria. God is in control of how their pride will be reduced to, to, to nothing. God gives Ahaz this detailed account of all that he is going to do to humble these prideful and self-reliant kingdoms. And here God now expands on that and he intensifies it for Ahaz. In verses 5, 6, and 7, God now turns to use a vivid metaphor of, of a river breaking its banks. What God gives to Ahaz is essentially here the story of two rivers, the Shiloh and the Euphrates. But God says in verse 6, 
that, that Israel and Syria, they have refused the waters of the Shiloh. Now that doesn't mean a lot to us. You may never have heard of the river of Shiloh before, but, but the, name, the Shiloh was the name of the water supply for Jerusalem. The, the, the stream that flowed from the Gihon Spring down into Jerusalem. You understand it's a metaphor for God's promises. Right, just as the Shiloh was a source of life for Jerusalem, this gently flowing stream that only brought blessings, that brought life, that brought security, that brought peace, that brought refreshment. It's a metaphor for God's promises. It's a metaphor for the redemption that God will bring for the faithful. But God says they have refused that. Israel and Syria, they have turned their backs on the Shiloh. They have turned their backs on the streams of God's blessing. And instead, they have gone after the Euphrates. That's what's being alluded to in the simple word there, the the river. The Euphrates was really the most famous, dominant river in the ancient Near East. And so it's just used the shorthand here, the river, but it's, it's appealing to the Euphrates, the strong, mighty, powerful, flowing river. We might think maybe of the, the, the Mississippi in our context. The image of, of a river that is virtually unstoppable in its force. What God is saying is Israel, Syria, they, they've turned their back on him. They've, they've ignored the the prophets. They've, they've refused the preaching of grace that has come to them through Elijah and Elisha and Obadiah and Amos. Even now as Isaiah is saying this to Ahaz, Israel is currently refusing to heed the preaching of Hosea. To the northern kingdom of Israel, the word of God's grace has gone out the, the streams of Shiloh have flowed to them, but they have turned their back on it. And instead, they've gone after the Euphrates. They have, they have decided to double down and arm themselves up. Instead of the way of grace, they will go the way of power. They will go the way of, of self-reliance. They will go the way of, of strength. But instead of blessing, God says, They will reap what they have sown. And instead of the blessing that comes from the Shiloh, they will be overtaken by the flood of the Euphrates. You know the imagery that's being appealed to here. You've you've seen images of it. You, You saw the videos that came out of Japan when the tsunami came a few years ago. That, that image of an unstoppable wall of water that though you could see it coming, you could do nothing about it. Right? Or maybe you've seen the Mississippian flood stage. You've seen how it's broken its banks. It's gone over the levees. It's scattered out into the floodplain. Maybe you've seen it in, in real life. Maybe just around here, you've seen the Altamaha in flood stage as it was for so much of the early months of this year. The idea of a river breaking its banks. It's a, it's a terrifying image. Because there's nothing that you can do to stop it. The rising of that water sweeps on. And it devastates everything in its path. And God says that's what will happen to Israel and Syria. They have courted the Euphrates. But they will be devastated by the Euphrates. They've gone after power and strength and military might and it is power and strength and military might that will be their undoing. Now this is great grace and condescension on God's part to Ahaz. This lifting of the curtain, this is grace on God's part. He did not need to do any of this. God has given his word. And to that word, he has added these children, these living witnesses. 
But yet here he goes on and he gives this detailed forewarning. He gives this vivid metaphor of everything that will face the rebellious. But notice there is one more part to this gracious condescension. God says in verse 8 that this devastating flood of his judgment through the Assyrians will sweep on into Judah. Do you understand what God is doing? He isn't just reassuring Ahaz that those kingdoms that he is so afraid of will crumble before the might of the Lord. Here the warning comes to Ahaz and says that unless he humbles himself before the Lord, the same fate awaits him. Unless he repents of his wicked self-reliance, then Judah too will be swept over by this flood of judgment. And in a painful irony, the land that bears the name of the promised child Emmanuel will indeed find God with them, but with them to judge and destroy and not bless and restore. Twice in Proverbs, in Proverbs 14 verse 12 and in Proverbs 16 verse 25, We're told that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. That's what this is all about. The course that Ahaz was pursuing, 2 Kings 16.7 tells us, Uh, was that Ahaz was sending messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, saying to him, I am your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who are attacking me. Verse 8 goes on and says, Ahaz also took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. But it's a plan that to you has no doubt seemed foolproof. How on earth could it be bad to get on the good side of the powerful Assyrians? The, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so Ahaz courts Tiglath Pileser. He goes after him. He bows down to him. He tells him that, that, that he is his servant, his son. He beseeches him to come and rescue him. He plies him with gifts and with with money. And how could that be bad? If If Israel and Syria are breathing down your neck, then surely ingratiating yourself with their more far with their far more powerful enemy is the best way of self defense. It is a way that seemed right to this man. It's a way that seems right to most humans, I I think. But what all of this is saying to Ahaz, what God in his grace is saying to him, is that this way may seem right, but it is in reality the way to death, because it is a way that rejects God. Do you remember our quote from Matthew Henry last week? Nothing is more grievous to the God of heaven than to be distrusted. To Ahaz, the way of faith undoubtedly looked as insecure as the Shiloh. The Shiloh, Jerusalem's water supply, it was a source of great blessing, but it was inherently vulnerable as it was an overland source of water and not an aquifer. Surely, as uh, undoubtedly as Ahaz looked at, at what he should do, the way of faith seemed so weak and as vulnerable as that stream. And the way of Tiglath Pileser, the way of courting the Assyrians, it looked as powerful and as sure and as confident as the Euphrates. But as one man has put it, to choose the world is to be overwhelmed by the world. 
Ahaz would reap what he had sown. And those waters of the Euphrates, they would not stop at the borders of his kingdom. But they would come and sweep down over him and his kingdom as well. And it doesn't take a lot of work to see how we can apply this, does it? First, it applies to those who are living self-reliant, self-dependent lives rejecting the offer of salvation in Christ and resolving to make their own way in this world. Now that may be a John Wayne style self-conscious declaration. I will not depend on anybody for anything including Jesus. I am going to stand on my own two feet and I will face whatever is coming my way. It, It might be that But more often, I think it is subtle. It's a quiet working away, a a trying to be as good as I can be to create the best life that I can here and now and to hopefully do enough good so that I can stand before God and be let into heaven when I die. But the clear message of this passage And the clear message of the rest of Scripture is that that might work for a while. But in the end, it will crumble and fall and it will leave you vulnerable before the justice of God and you will face the full reckoning for your sin. It's what we find here. It's what Jesus said repeatedly throughout his ministry. Jesus constantly warning people about the judgment that is to come against sins. Jesus repeatedly warning of the judgment of God, which he described as the unquenchable fire, as the eternal punishment, as the hell of fire that awaits those who do not yield in humble submission to God. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9, Paul writes that on the last day, The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will, Paul says, suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Scripture is full of warnings. That those who persist in stubborn rebellion against God, whether they do it with a, with a clenched jaw and a determination that they will be their own men and do live life on their own terms, or whether it is that, that quiet, subtle self-reliance. Scripture is full of warnings that any kind of rebellion against God, any refusal to humble yourself before Him and cast yourself upon Christ. Scripture warns you there is a terrible judgment awaiting you. There is a Euphrates that will come and sweep you away. And as we said at the beginning, those warnings do not come to to manipulate you, to, 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 to scare you into submission. They do not come just to, to gloat over you or any such thing. These warnings come as a gift of God's gracious patience and condescension. These warnings are the call of heaven to you to see the hollowness of your own power and wisdom, to cast yourself now upon the mercy of God. They are a gracious forewarning so that you can now give up your sinful self-reliance and turn to Christ and hide yourself in Him and be saved from that judgment of God. And so the first application is to those who are not yet Christians. Ahaz stands as a great warning to you, a living illustration of the foolishness of self-reliance. Ahaz stands as a warning to you. And an invitation to see his error and to repent of your sins and to find security and salvation by putting your faith in Christ. But there is a second application that comes to us who are Christians. 
Because it is not that we put our faith in Christ and then suddenly we give up our self-reliance. We can have genuine faith and truly trust in Christ, but yet get enamored by this world around us and begin to functionally, if not explicitly, look to the Euphrates rather than to the Shiloh. Look to the way of power rather than to the way of faith. To try and find security in the things of this world than in the promises of God. It's the story of churches throughout the ages who have tried to ingratiate themselves with the ruling power in the belief that it will provide them security. If only they could have the power brokers on their side, then they would be secure and content. Then they would have freedom from fear. But you understand, just as it would for Ahaz, it has persistently rung hollow. Almost universally it has been, it has proved true that to choose the world is to be overwhelmed by the world. Those churches have been co-opted by the world's power brokers. And they have been used as tools to promote their own agendas. It is always a dangerous thing when Christianity becomes popular. The rise of civic Christianity almost always results in a watered down and compromised Christianity. Now I don't know how you are praying for the church just now, but it is clear that Christianity in America is increasingly out of favor. I read an article this past week that drew attention to five cases that are coming before the Supreme Court just now that could have massive implications for the freedom of religion in America. How are you praying for that? Right, there is a danger that we just pray that Christianity would be popular again. That we would pray that the power brokers of our society would, would give... Uh, would, would acknowledge Christ. That, that our politicians would be openly Christian. Maybe that Hollywood that, that yields such enormous power and influence would grow sympathetic cr to Christianity. Now those would in a way be wonderful things. But they come with this danger. To court our power brokers may seem wise. But it may end in devastation. Right? What this passage is teaching us is that the firmer way is simply to trust in the promises of God that he will rule and defend his church. Jesus isn't afraid of the world's power brokers. In fact, in, in Psalm 2, we're told that Jesus sits in heaven and he laughs at them. Matter-of-factly, Jesus warned us repeatedly in the Gospels that the world will hate his people just as they hated him. And he saw it as no hindrance to the mission of the church, just understanding it as a reality that his people will face. The mission will go forth. God will achieve his purposes. His church will be built. The gates of hell will not prevail against them. And all his people are called to do is faithfully served. God is in control. He rules all things according to the counsel of his will, including the politics of the ancient Near East, including the fortunes of the church in 21st century America. And so the call to us in this day when Christianity is increasingly out of favor is to resist the temptation to court our power brokers as if they are the ones who hold our fortunes in their hands, as if they are the ones who hold our security in their hands. And the call to us is simply to heed the words of chapter 7, verse 9, to be firm in faith, because if we are not firm in faith, then we are not firm at all. And lastly, this applies to our own lives. Now again, we may well trust in Christ, we may well have true and genuine faith in him, but there's always a temptation for us to take out 
a little insurance policy. We know that Jesus won't fail us, but just in case he does, we, we know he won't, but just in case, we want to make sure that we have done all that we can to make our lives on this earth as secure as possible. I know that Jesus has promised to provide my daily bread. But I'll just do everything that I can to secure my family's future. I know that my children have been born into the covenant community and they have been baptized and given the sign and seal of the covenant but I'm going to go ahead and do all that I can to make sure that they profess their faith in Christ early and often. I'll, I'll pay for a youth minister. I'll, I'll send them to camps. I'll pump the gospel into them by any means necessary. I know that I have nothing to fear on this earth, that even my greatest enemy can only ever take away my life, and that for me in Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know that I have nothing to fear, but I'll arm myself, I'll triple lock my house, I'll live in the best area, I'll make sure that my car, uh, that my family drives the car with the greatest safety rating, and they only eat the healthiest of foods, and they get the best health care, and they take their vitamins. Now, of course, none of that is wrong necessarily. It is good to take care of your family's finances. It is good to be diligent about the evangelization and the discipleship of your children. It is good to try and cultivate security and safety for your family. None of that is necessarily wrong, but it might be. And it's, it's not wrong to be financially responsible, to make sure that you're not reckless in your spending, but it is wrong if it means that you are not tithing. It means if you are not able to be generous with others, it is wrong if you are holding on to that money, holding on to that bank balance with an iron grip, as if uh, it is if you are counting your money like Silas Marner at the end of every day, saying to yourself that you know that you will be okay because you have enough money in the bank. It's not wrong to speak to your children about the gospel regularly. In fact, I hope that if you are Christian parents, you are doing that very thing. That fathers, you are leading your family in, in family worship. That, that you are talking with your children about the church service on these Sunday mornings and lunchtimes and afternoons. I hope that you are sending your children to places where they will hear the gospel and put their faith in Christ. But listen, that is wrong. If your greatest nightmare is your children walking away from the faith. Now, now that is always heartbreaking. But as Reformed Christians, as Calvinists, we know that the hearts of our children are in the hands of God. We know that salvation is of the Lord. And so while we grieve their faithlessness, we pray to God, we appeal to their baptisms, and we trust God for the rest. It's not wrong to be secure. It's not wrong to seek safety for your family. But it is if the pursuit of health and safety becomes the controlling factor of your life and keeps you away from serving God freely and joyfully, if it keeps you away from taking risks in the service of God, in the exercise of your spiritual gifts, in the pursuit of the opportunities that God gives you both in ministry and in your vocation. Like for us as Christians, the way of Shiloh can seem foolish. It can seem foolish to trust in the promises of God and leave it all to Him. It can be tempting for us to go the way of the Euphrates, to seek the power of this world to keep us secure. But as Matthew Henry said, nothing is more grievous to the God of heaven than to be distrusted. It might seem like a respectable sin, but it strikes at the heart of your faith. These passages of judgment, and there are a lot of them in Isaiah and in the prophets, and there are a lot of them in our New Testament. These passages of judgment can seem so heavy, or maybe 
better they can seem so unsophisticated to us, something to scare the people of a different age. But you understand there's nothing here that's designed to manipulate. These are gifts of God's grace. There is nothing cruel about them. They are gifts of God's goodness. They tell you of God's righteousness and his justice and his goodness and his truth. And it tells you that that means that God cannot let sin go unpunished. But they come to you. And the very fact that God is warning you of these things is an invitation that you would repent of your sin and cast yourself on his mercy. These passages of judgment are simply another way of preaching the gospel. That gospel is there for you. It is free. Lay hold of Christ and turn from your sin. And the gospel says, our Bibles say, Isaiah says, you will be saved. And for those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who have put our trust and our confidence in him, then let these passages drive you to heed 2 Peter 1.10. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and your election. See here the character of your God. Lean into him. Trust him more fully and more freely than you have ever done. And just rest and be at peace in his good providence. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us to see you as you are and to praise you as we ought. Father, I pray for any who have heard this word, preached this morning, who have not yet put their faith in Christ. Lord, I pray that now they would turn from their sin and their self-reliance And they would cast themselves upon Christ. And that they would find in him the mercy of a gracious God. And I pray for those of us who do take the name of Christ upon us, who are Christians. That you would help us to see you as you are. To trust you, to follow you. To not go the way that seems right to a man. To not walk by sight but simply to proceed by faith, knowing what you have said and trusting that you will do it. O oh Lord, come now and bless us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>